In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is Thomas Sunday, where we commemorate um, when the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to his disciples in the upper room, uh, while Thomas the Apostle was not present. Uh, and then after they saw Thomas again, um, they told him in John chapter 20, it says, The other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. And yet Thomas was skeptical, he didn't believe, and he said, Unless I put my hands in the wounds in his side and his hands, then I will not believe. And then the Lord appeared to Thomas again at another time and showed him the wound so that he would believe. Sometimes we also doubt the significance of the resurrection or that we maybe take it for granted, um, having been born in the New Testament and having been taught in the church that we have access to paradise and that when we die, um, we can go and be with the Lord in paradise. Maybe this is something that we take for granted as though it's always been this, this way. Um, that the way that people have always lived is if they lived a life of faith and they lived a good life and they have a hope of resurrection and they have a hope of going to a beautiful and wonderful place after they die and to spend eternity in joy and peace with God and that this is something that they look forward to. But actually it was not always the case. Um, when we contemplate what it was like for those people in the Old Testament who had no hope, who they believed that when they died they would go to Sheol, which is Hades, and there was no other place for them to go because there was not yet any redemption or salvation that had been completed by the Lord. Nor at the time did they even understand what the salvation would even look like. When they spoke about the Messiah, they didn't understand who the Messiah was going to be, other than an earthly ruler, someone who was going to um, conquer the enemies of Israel and restore the kingdom of David the way that it was in the glory days. Um, so they didn't even have a concept or understanding of what is it that the Lord was giving us, that he was granting us eternal life, not just victory over our temporary enemies in the world, but granting us victory over the spiritual enemies, the ultimate enemy itself, which is death. So I want to speak a little bit about the significance of the resurrection of the dead. The Lord himself, when he was on earth, he raised people from the dead, like the, um, the son of the widow, uh, this young man, he says he came and he touched this open coffin where this man was lying, and those who carried him stood still, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. This man was raised from the dead. He was in his own funeral, um, being carried by others while he was in his coffin, and the Lord, seeing the man, he touched him, and he raised him from the dead. Um, however, this man died again. The, after he was raised, he, 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 he lived the rest of his life, um, and he died again. But the significance of the resurrection is not just the Lord um, raising somebody from the dead, um, but actually, number one, that the Lord raised himself from the dead. Right. Um, in the case of this young man or the other people that the Lord raised from the dead, God, who was powerful, raised another person. Right. But in the idea of the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of the Lord, it's showing us that that death had no power over God, that he was able to raise himself from the dead even after he had died, which means that death did not really kill him. That death was not a powerful force that, that ended his life the way that all people had always seen death. Death has always been the most frightening thing for all the people because in death a person dies and never returns as is lives uh, uh, kind of like like it's destroyed there's some destruction there is some um, person is like one day is alive and talking and moving and 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 living and then the next moment they're still there's nothing that they are saying there's nothing that they're doing the person almost in a sense for at least from the worldly perspective it's like they cease to exist um, they stop existing. Um, and yet the Lord demonstrated that even though he went through the same process of death, and yet he rose from the dead because death had no power over him. And then he said that just as he rose from the dead, so also all of us have the opportunity to rise from the dead, that if we believe in him, we also will partake of the same resurrection. So this was not just a one-time miracle that the Lord did in rising from the dead, but something that he promised to all of us that we also will rise from the dead. And we sing about this resurrection of the dead that the Lord accomplished for us in the hymn of the resurrection that we chant while we do the procession around the church. It says, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. So the interesting part is that he trampled down death by death. Like the Lord took the, the instrument of death 
the, the thing that was the most frightful, the death itself, and he transformed its nature from being something that is frightful to something that is life-giving. And this is the way that the Lord operates. He doesn't cancel the bad thing. He doesn't take the thing that's bad and he says, I'm going to make it not happen. No, but he changes its nature so that it is no longer bad. Whenever we are speaking about trials, for instance, and how the Lord allows us to go through various trials in our life, God never said that I will no longer allow you to go through trial. The trial still exists. We still go through trials and we experience pain and suffering in the world. But God said, I will transform the nature of these trials so that they are now for your benefit instead of being something for your destruction. This is the difference between the believer and the non-believer. So also, God took death, which is something that we still have to pass through. Our physical bodies still die. But he transformed it to be something that brings life, brings eternal life, something actually to be look forward to it rather than something to fear. And he took his own death, which Satan and all the people who are the enemies of Christ saw his crucifixion as being a victory for them, and yet he transformed it to be a defeat of all of the enemies and a victory for himself and a victory for all of the believers. But we ask the question is, who is it that is resurrected? What does it mean to be resurrected? Resurrection means that you take something that is dead and you make it to be alive again. In Romans chapter 6, St. Paul says, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we, all, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So it means that the only people who can participate in the resurrection of Christ are those people who have died in Christ. Right? If a person has not died in Christ, then they cannot resurrect in Christ. So we can look at this death in Christ, we can look at it in three different aspects. The first death that we speak about the death of the believer is the death that happens in baptism okay in death that happens in baptism in in romans 6 also it says therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life so this first step of the christian walk which is to be baptized is actually death it is a death of the old man, a death of the flesh, and the rebirth in, of something new. When, when the Lord was speaking to Nicodemus, he said to him, you have to be born again of water and spirit. Meaning the first birth is the physical birth, but the second birth, the, the birth of water and from water and spirit in baptism, is the spiritual birth. The one that allows us to gain access to all the benefits of Christ, to the forgiveness of sins, to the resurrection of the dead, um, and so on. This is why... The, the beginning of the process of life and salvation and renewal is actually death. So the Lord, again, he has taken something that is death and he has turned it into life for us. That we partake of his death, but we don't remain dead. We partake of his death and then we are, are risen from the dead just as he is risen. The second step, the second role of death in the life of the believer is how we continue to live our life throughout how do we live our life throughout our life? Again, in Romans 6, it says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And in verse 13, he says, But if, the spi if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So the second stage of death is putting to death the deeds of the body, putting to death the lustful desires of the flesh, putting to death the things that our bodies, our flesh naturally desires that are contrary to God, that lead us away from God in our life. So the first stage was to die in the baptism. The second stage is to die to, in Christ to all of the, the lusts of the flesh. This is what the spiritual struggle looks like. When we talk about, we'll talk about what is the spiritual struggle of a person who is struggling in their life, it is this stage. It is to put to death the deeds of the flesh and the lusts of the flesh and to, to, that, uh, the, to, to reject the system of the world that is um, attracting us to itself and all the attachments that are in the world and materialism and pleasures and so on, and to pursue the spiritual practices. You know, we just finished the great fast where we are very keenly aware of the kind of spiritual practices as a church that we practice. It is difficult. What we practice is difficult. We go through a long period of time of denying our bodies. You know, and someone might ask, what is the purpose? What is the purpose of having gone through all of this denial 
um, that that we are we are experiencing and we are voluntarily taking on ourselves this denial. And the thing actually that we are denying ourselves of is not bad. It is not bad to eat meat. It is not a sin to eat. Why do we deny ourselves? Well, it is a training. It is to train ourselves so that we can control our urges. We can con- control ourselves and the things that are not bad, like like eating certain foods, then that means we can also control ourselves when it comes to the lusts of the flesh, when it comes to this, our sinful nature. And so we pursue spiritual practices, we pursue asceticism. This is putting to death the lusts of the flesh. Why again do we put it to death? So that we can be resurrected. Because we want, we want only those who are dead are the ones who are resurrected. The third and final stage of death in our life is the physical death, the actual death that happens to our bodies. In, uh, in Revelation chapter 2, it says, Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Meaning, if we endure, continue in this death through the rest of our life, then this is when actually we gain the crown of righteousness. This is when we actually partake and participate with the Lord in the actual resurrection. We have a spiritual resurrection in Christ in baptism. We continue struggling against our flesh, putting to death the deeds of the flesh in our life. And then finally, our, the ultimate act of resurrection is that when we physically die, we will be raised. We will be raised. We will not remain dead because God has canceled the power of death. He has transformed the power of death and made it into something that is life-giving. And so we look forward to the resurrection. And when we, we say the creed, we say we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come because we are always looking forward. The person who is not looking forward to the resurrection of the dead, to this person, all of the spiritual life that we do is nonsense. It's, it's meaningless. Uh, the person who isn't looking forward to the resurrection of the dead, they say there is no reason to fast. There is no reason to struggle. There is no reason to confess. There is no reason to deny myself. There's no reason to be baptized, to be honest, from the beginning. Because all of these things that are death, they are the manifestation of death. They are saying we reject this life. We are saying the person that I was born from my mother's womb, I reject this person. I don't want this person. I want the renewed person. I want the person who is transformed and changed, which is why I consent to baptism. And then the person who wants to live a life that is pleasing to God, looking forward to the resurrection, puts to death the deeds of the body. We reject sin, and we want to live a life of holiness. And then the person who is looking forward to the resurrection is not afraid of death, because for them, death is just a doorway to heaven. It's just something that leads us to a life that we would prefer, a life that we want, a life that we look forward to. So we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. And so this, in a very briefly, this, this is what the resurrection is about. It is a renewal, it is a change, it is a transformation. It is canceling the power of death and, and transforming its nature so that it is something that is life-giving. And why we celebrate in these holy 50 days the resurrection of the Lord, remembering that this was not always the case. Remembering that 2,000 years ago, when people died before the resurrection of Christ, they had no hope. There was nothing for them to look forward to. Death was truly frightening. Death was something that was um, a punishment. Death was something that was that was like brings terror to the people. Whereas now we don't have to look at death in this way. Though it is inevitable that we all pass through it, but its nature has changed, and now we look forward to it. And even those people that are our loved ones that have died, we don't have to look at them in sorrow. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, Do not sorrow like those in the world who have no hope over those people who have died, over our loved ones that have died, because we believe in the resurrection. So even those who have died, we believe that we will be reunited with them again, and we will see them again in heaven. And this is, again, something for us to look forward to. So we celebrate the resurrection because it was the complete transformation of of life, because the one inevitable thing that happens to all of us is death, and the nature of death has changed now. It is not something to be fearful of. It's not something to try to escape, but it's something to embrace and to prepare ourselves to prepare ourselves to be united with Christ in heaven, to be reunited with our, our loved ones in heaven, and to live a life that is pleasing to him, and glory be to God forever. Amen.